Hello everyone, this demonstration is going to be uh, for the FIMS version 1.1 uh, repository interface sample. So the idea of this particular um, presentation is really going to be to demonstrate what are the different FIMS operations uh, that are in reference to the repository that can be executed. So this was essentially something that was developed by Trisco in collaboration between myself, Gaurav, and Luik as well. So why don't we get started as far as what the sample implementation includes. So the sample um, implementation uh, executes a series of operations that are essential to the repository, such as uh, operations such as the generate the unique ID, where you have to essentially get some uniqueness to identify the assets themselves. It executes operations against the RCR, which are, again, at the heart of the repository uh, interface design and implementation as well. And basically, it's, it's really for, a, it represents a foundation for the service implementation. So the idea off of this is if there is a repository uh, vendor that's out there that needed to have some guidance as far as implementing and executing a series of operations against the FIMS repository and actually get those operations to uh, work in a real life example, they can use this reference implementation guide to get them started so they're not starting at, at point zero. Um, so, essentially, it's, it's broken out into two, right? So there's the implementer. So what I just mentioned right now would be, take an example, Dalit or um, any other major, you know, system that's out there that has a repository can use that. Clients. So now that the vendor has implemented the FIMS repository solution, there's the other side of it, which is really for the client, right? The consumer. So how does the consumer? issue the operations that they need to uh, issue to the actual repository in order for them to exercise the behavior that they desire. So at, at, the, you know, at, the, at the roughest level to think of it, uh, it was actually mentioned in previous presentations, we now treat files uh, not as files but as objects. So objects are with metadata and the physical files themselves. So all the operations that we're going to be dealing with over here are going to demonstrate the object and then the actual physical file is just an extension property on side of that object itself. So, oops, sorry. So the repository interface definition. So it provides basic CRUD operations, a way of you know, a vendor to be able to exercise the add essence, the retrieve essence, the update of the metadata, and for purging and removing the essence itself. So, I mean, that's essential to any app, that's application 101, right? You, you need to have those CRUD operations in place. And the repository is no different. Repository exercises those operations to basically leverage those uh, methods that have been defined with a, with a set of instructions that have to be pro provided to those methods to be able to uh, exercise each one of the different methods. So as part of the reference implementation, when we go through the example, we'll be demonstrating and executing these operations. Um, so we also, as such, will have a way of actually updating the metadata within the object itself, such as the title, the description, and as you know, many of you may or may not know, you can extend the metadata within the BMO itself, which is at the heart of you know, FIMS, to include extension properties as well, because client one is going to be different than client B, C, D, et cetera. So, and, and a, another main feature that we have is the ability to query the interface to retrieve media assets. So now, great, we have assets that are sitting within the repository, but at the same time, <laughs> we need to be able to execute operations to, be, uh, re to, to basically retrieve the assets that are within the repositories themselves so that the user can take action such as retrieving it uh, and doing whatever manipulation that they may need to do. So what, what, does the, what does it not do? Oh, I'm sorry, the last point over here is that the, the service interface, uh, one of the main reasons of driving the implementation is really the fact that it is meant to be driven off of a workflow engine. So there is no human interaction that is meant to be driven off of the repository method. So it's not meant, I mean, as part of the de demonstration, I'm going to be doing that, but the idea is you have these set of instructions and operations that are being exercised through um, a process such as a workflow engine. Uh, so what does it not do? So it does not handle uh, workflow operations such as archiving and transcoding because 
when you do an ad essence within a repository, within the repository operation itself, you can leverage some of the FIMS other repos I'm sorry, other FIMS interfaces such as transfer and transform. As part of this, it wasn't that's out of the scope as far as the definition. I mean, can someone implement it? Absolutely, you can leverage the uh, the transfer service that you have within FIMS to do the ad essence. For that matter, you could use it for retrieve essence as well. But that is on the implementer. It's not explicit set of rules that have been defined by anybody to say you have to follow the, this procedure. Um, we also don't have relationships between the objects. So you have uh, your object store, which is within the repository, which has the actual BMO objects, which contain the metadata, the physical assets. But there's no relationship. Each one of the, the entries that are inside of the actual um, you know, repository itself are meant to be and, and live their own life cycle. They have no relationship to any other content that may or may not be within the repository itself. And the and and as I mentioned previously, it's not meant to be driven off of a user interface. So as part of the FIMS repository architecture, you know, you, you have to now support various ways of actually implementing and exercising these operations, such as using SOAP, because that is, for certain applications, the requirement, um, because that's just the way, let's say, a workflow engine may have been developed, external, internal SOA architecture could be leveraging those uh, practices. But at the same time, through evolution and having mo more, you know, mobile devices and, and web-based solutions, uh, there are, there is an implementation in REST as well to be able to exercise the same operation. So you can use SOAP, you can use uh, REST, and, and for that matter, it doesn't matter which one you use, the behavior of what you will be executing should be transparent. Um, so you also have synchronous and asynchronous operations. So I add a BMO, there's nothing to it, right? I mean, I added the metadata about an asset within the repository, so I give it a title, I give it a description, I give it some additional metadata, and that is a synchronous operation. There are asynchronous operations. So within the media industry, obviously, it's much different than financial. And financial, everything is, low, everything is low latency, everything is synchronous. Very few asynchronous operations required. Well, in media, we're dealing with large objects. We're dealing with gigs, uh, terabytes, maybe in some cases for archiving uh, solutions. So in, in those situations, we have to exercise these as asynchronous operations. So an orchestration system calls uh, a repository to add an essence. Now, depending on the size of the file, that operation can take minutes, seconds, hours, days, etc. So, one of the features that you have within, and that was very well thought out by the, the group that, uh, that, that actually worked in the repository, was to identify uh, you know, certain parameters and constraints as far as asynchronous operations, patterns that should be followed. And um, in, in certain cases, on, on our personal implementation as well, we've actually reaped the benefits of following those practices to actually get a viable solution that's been very productive and efficient. Um, and you also have the ability to supply credentials of when you connect to, and I will demonstrate that when, when we go through the presentation. We have, um, we have notifications as well. So notifications are initial, as part of the request, I mean, classic system, you have the you know, polling mechanism, you, you, you create a request and you sit there, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? That could work in some cases, but to have a more responsive system, you want to have the ability to have notification built in. So as part of your request, uh, you pass in, well, if I have an exception, where should I send that message notification? Same thing, if I succeed, where should I send my message notification? Um, and then, you know what, as part of a vendor solution, they can ex even extend that if they need to and actually send additional notifications such as, such as progress as well. But again, as part of the demonstration today, we will not be going into uh, the notification section. So, and then you also have properties, configuration settings uh, as part of the RCR. So within the RCR, you have the ability to define certain parameters about the repository. You know, what, what is the max size, for example, that I could do an ad essence because of constraints that I could have within the repository itself. Uh, same thing, what is the total size of my repository? So all of those things can be defined and configured within the RCR. So this is a diagram that, that many of you, if you view a lot of the different presentations, you'll get familiar with. But this is really defining 
the orchestration system and how it is meant to interact with the uh, FIMS repository. So it's broken out into three major components, right? You have the FIMS repository interface. So that is where the orchestration system will execute the adding of the BMO, the adding of the essence, retrieving of the essence, et cetera. Then you have the RCR, which is essentially the, um, the registry which has the capabilities of the repository. So it's the repository capabilities registry. And within there, you define location, locations, paths, where can the repository retrieve files from? Where can the repository uh, deliver files to as part of the delivery mechanism? Um, and then, obviously, you also have the repository event and notification system as well, which defines the notifications and the structure as far as the message uh, package that will be delivered back to the system. So it's being done in a consistent manner. So we talked about the retrieve the repository configuration from the RCR. We talked about the adding content retrieve essence. And we talked about the, uh, you know, the asset purged callback on completion or failure. So that the sample, as I mentioned before, is going to implement the first two set of features. The notification is not part. Now, let's take a step back. So uh, FIMS 101. Uh, in FIMS 101, what do I mean by that? You have a basic concept of representation of an object. An object is a BMO. The BMO is composed of, of a hierarchy. You have the metadata, which is going to be inside of the BM content type, which has the editorial information and the asset identifiers. You then have the information um, about the content that's within the asset. So as I said, a, a video could be Obama walking uh, with China, China president. That could be the, the title and the editorial information. But you can have m multiple uh, you know, content formats within that object, right? So you could have the HD uh, file, you could have the SD MPEG, you could have proxy files, you could have you know, other variants. So that is what is meant to exist within the BM content format. Uh, so we'll have bit rate, et cetera, file size information. And lastly, you have the physical files where they're actually located, so an MXF, can reside on the cloud, for example. So you could have the pad to uh, the cloud location for that asset, or it could be the nearline storage or, or the offline storage. So everything that I'm mentioning over here, as far as the BMO, is going to be executed as part of the sample uh, repository implementation. And uh, so this is a little bit more of a breakdown into the BM Essence locator. So it's, it's a very complex, um, you know, container where you can, you can just have a single file and a location to that single file, or you could have multiple files, such as smooth streaming files, which are composed of, you know, multiple files. So that structure currently supports that. As part of the implementation, we are just going to be going with a sing single file that is going to be associated with the Essence uh, locator. So uh, this is just a demonstration of metadata at the various levels that I've uh, defined before. So you have your BM content type, BM content format, and the essence locator. As I mentioned before, you have the ability to extend at every single level uh, if there is a need to. Uh, and an example could be to define within the content format, you could have the MPEG, the MXF, uh, or the proxy. But within there, one of them can be identified as the mezzanine file. So that could be interpreted differently by the orchestration system to, uh, to exercise a set of behaviors. So everything over here is, um, is demonstrating the different methods that are available within the repository, within the FIMS 1.1. The check mark next to the operations over here uh, identify what are the methods that are being executed as part of the, the implementation that I'll be demonstrating. The one check mark over here, the remove content, is part of the demonstration. It's not shown on this diagram over here, but it is, and we'll go through that as well. So uh, if we keep going over here, and within the RCR, the method that we are going to be exercising is going to be the get general capabilities. Then you have the FIMS repository event and notifications, uh, which we said that we will not really be covering as part of this exercise. And the use cases uh, that will be covered as part of this are going to be creating a new BMO in the FIMS repository with a format and essence, uh, adding a new essence to an existing BMO, getting the essence from the repository, which is your retrieve essence, the updating of properties within the BMO, the removing of the essence from the existing BMO, unremoving the essence, purging the essence, removing the BMO, unremoving the BMO, purge BMO, and query BMO. So without 
further. Oh, so the last things to mention over here, we are, we, we wanted to kind of leave this a little bit open and not tie it to a, a particular uh, solution. So what we did was we, we decided to write the sample um, FIMS repository in .NET 4.5 C Sharp. So anyone that goes on the internet, there is a readme file if you download the FIMS ref, uh, re repository implementation. The readme file contains the prerequisites which include downloading the SOAP UI, installing uh, Visual Studio, which you can get download for free, and it basically at that point, if you follow the set of instructions over there, you will be able to actually use SOAP UI to exercise the set of operations. So let's get started. So starting off over here, we have a screen uh, which starts off when you start the, the sample reference implementation. It's developed in Visual Studio, as I mentioned before. When you start it, you land on this page. It just says FIMS sample implementation. This is our FIMS repository that's actually executing at this point in time. If I go to SOAP UI now, I can, uh, I have already loaded over here the SOAP UI project which can execute the various FIMS operations. So the first operation, as I mentioned before, that is probably the actually two most crucial operations. One is getting the general capabilities. So why would an orchestration system need to call the uh, the get general capabilities. It would be for the reason that we need to, for example, get the path for where can I put the files uh, in order for the, uh, for the repository system to be able to ingest the file. So the path is defined within the RCR. So as I highlighted over here, in my location is my local drive. I called it sample repository in. That is going to be the location where I have my physical files residing. And so that is my well-known source locations. Then there's the well-known destination locations. You can have more than one, there's no restriction. Again, as part of the sample, we are just demonstrating one. So my repository can deliver files to this location, so the sample repository out. So why don't we look at the folder structure for, for a second before we get started. So if I go into uh, the C drive over here and I go to the sample repository, there's three folders over here. So you have your in, right, as I mentioned, where my repository can retrieve files from my out where uh, if I had a file residing and I execute the retrieve essence, it can retrieve the file out too. And then the third folder over here is storage. So the storage, imagine, is, is a location which is internal to the repository. So in the cloud case, that could be the cloud location. In this case over here, it's just demonstrating that the storage location is not visible uh, to a client. I mean, in reality, you know, a person that is using a system and they ingest an asset only should understand the asset at the time that it starts. They should never really have an understanding of where the asset goes. If they need to, they execute retrieve essence and then your file comes back. There's no need for, as I mentioned before, users to be tied to the solution of file-based, folder-based solutions uh, as far as driving workflows. So, uh, as I said, general capabilities over here shows you the in and out locations. So let's go through a use case. So we said, um, an asset has a life, you know, it's, it's not just, hey, I drop a file, I delete a file, it's more than that. If that was the case, then how do you find the file late, later on, you know, if, if it was as simple as that. So the very first thing, as I mentioned before, that we need to be able to do is execute the, uh, the generate unique ID. So here's an example where I have my credentials passed in, and, at, you know, this, this, is, this is the actual SOAP message that is going to be executed against the FIMS repository. So if I were to execute this, you see on the right-hand side, I get a GUID. So that's step number one, generate unique ID to, to identify uniqueness within your repository so you could avoid conflict. The next operation over here now is going to be creating my uh, BMO, right? So let's go over here. I have, in my example, a request that I've created. I've put in unique identifiers. I've already pre-filled this information. I'm not gonna go one by one. We'd be sitting here forever. So. I gave a title and I gave an, uh, an alternative title to this BMO. If I now execute this, I get a response back. So this was a synchronous operation, not asynchronous. Very important fact to note over here because on the right hand side over here, I retrieve back the information that this asset actually exists within my repository now. Now, how do you know I'm not just saying that? So I know that because if I now go and execute two operations. so. We executed the adding of the content to the repository. I demonstrated the generate of the unique ID. I demonstrated how the repository knows where to get the files in, how to deliver files out. Now the next operations are 
now that my asset resides within the repository, how do I get it you know, later on? So we, there are multiple ways of doing it. One way is to execute uh, get content. So if I execute got, get content, I do have to supply my ID for, that uniquely identifies that asset. So on the right-hand side, you see my uh, full information that's returned back from the repository. Another alternative way of doing that is to execute get content collection. Now, if I had more than one asset, so again, get content only executes against one single asset. Get content collection, if I have two um, BMOs, so let me go back. I'm going to add a, a different BMO now. So here's my asset number two. So now I have two BMOs residing within my repository. My get content on the top over here. If I execute it against content number two, it gives me that single asset. Now, if I want to look at all the assets, I execute get content collection. If I execute that, you see on the right-hand side, I have two BMOs. Now, these are just empty objects. So this was someone requesting a piece of video, for example, let's say within, uh, I don't know, a newsroom, for example, that I want a, a piece of footage of Obama. Now someone has to go do the work and they have to now associate a physical asset. So now let's go into that. How do you do that? That operation is at essence. So what I have right now is I've identified a file which is inside of my in location. Now it's the repository's responsibility now to ensure that the path that's being passed in by the user is validated against the RCR. Now what do I mean by that? I can go in and change this to C sample repository tests and whatever. But your repository should have the intelligence to do some validation to say, you know what? My RCR has exposed to the orchestration system. I can only allow files to come in from this location. So you can build that intelligence because in this case over here, I have access to my folder. But imagine it's an FTP drop location where you have a set of credentials and that's the only location your repository can get to on a client machine. In that case over here, this solution wouldn't work, right? So uh, at this point, I have a file, one.mxf. If I go into the in location, here's my file that's residing over here, and it only exists in the in-location, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to execute the ad essence. Now, when I did this on the right-hand side, I got back the, uh, the response for the asynchronous operation. If there was notification, I would automatically start receiving notification. In this case over here, I can pull. So if I go into the get content collection, right, and I go on the right-hand side, you see now my first BMO that I have which uh, has the description on the bottom over here, now has a BM content format associated with it. I have the package size inside of the, the content format. And inside of that, I also have the essence itself. Now my essence, the status is online, okay? So as far as the user is concerned, the file got delivered to the storage. Now, if I go now into the folder structure again, I had shown everybody that in the in location there was a set of files. The out folder is blank because I have not retrieved my essence yet. But if I go into the storage location, again, this is abstracted. User does not know what the storage is, okay? But you see that the file has not been delivered over here, right? So now we're just going to build on top of this case over here. So great, now user, and this is the life of an, an asset or an object as I like to call it. So we got it into the system. Now the normal use case over here would be someone now needs to retrieve it because they have the raw video that could be sitting inside of the storage that someone now needs to edit. Okay, so it's a black box uh, because uh, if you open the black box to the user, then you have the ability for users to corrupt your system. So again, we said this could be on the cloud, wherever this is, or the archive. So now I'm going to execute the retrieve essence. So if we go into the retrieve essence operation, there's multiple ways of retrieving the essence. One way is to specify the location by the name. So in this case over here, remember in the RCR I had demonstrated, actually if I go back to that for a second, it might be worth uh, showing. The, there's a couple of properties in the supported destination locations. One is the name, so we gave it out, and then the path associated with it. So when you do retrieve essence as part, in the as part of an orchestration system, you have the flexibility of defining the name of the destination or you have the ability to specify the path. It, it doesn't matter, whichever one you specify. The bottom line is, is the, the, the repository internally should be doing validation to ensure that whatever parameters, again, are specified for the retrieve essence for an orchestration system 
are actual paths that the repository is aware of, and the only way to do that is to validate it against the RCR. So let, let's pick name, because you know what? We, we like names. So if I execute this now, again, this, uh, this is an asynchronous operation, OK? Again, file size is large. Uh, it could take a long time to retrieve them. So while this is going on, if I go into the out location, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the out location. So here's my file, and now my file has been delivered into my nearline location. So now a client, so we've demonstrated uh, adding a BMO, we've demonstrating uh, adding the essence, we've retrieved the essence. Now the life of a BMO moves on. Now the next evolutionary step could be to, to remove your essence out of the repository. So let's see how that is done. So there is an operation that is defined called remove essence. So, you know, just to be very clear, when you execute the remove essence operation, it is just flagging the essence within the repository to say this, this essence should be, or this physical file should be deleted. It does not actually delete. There's a separate operation for that. So a use case for this over here could be, you could have a weekly batch process that just goes in to do the bulk uh, purging of essences so that you're not you know, using up the resources within the systems uh, all the time to do purge. I mean, everything in the end of the day is expensive. So you want to maybe minimize that, offload it to a bulk process by a workflow that could be defined. So that could be an, a use case. So let's go ahead and remove the content. So now that I've done this, if I go back into my get content collection, and if I were to execute this, this will show me my two BMOs. Here's BMO number one. Here's my BMO number two. But if I scroll back up over here, you'll notice that the essence is no longer visible. So this means that if an orchestration system were to execute retrieve essence or some operation against the essence, uh, the orchestration system would not be allowed. Okay. So now the next operation we're going to say is, okay, well, that was accidentally done. I want to now put the essence back so that I could now uh, use it again. So you can quickly go and execute the unremove content for content number one, essence number one. So the last operation that I executed was the uh, unremove of the essence. So now my repository on the right hand side will now display uh, my essence again. So we have now unremoved, we've removed, unremoved the essence. So you know what, let's just, I could do one of two ways. One way that I could also do this now is demonstrate the actual remove, uh, removal of the BMO itself. So why don't we go down that route? So the next operation that I'll, I'll do now is the remove of the content. So if I were to execute that, that's now saying that the asset that is holding the information is no longer available within the repository. Uh, again, it is not purged. You still explicitly, just as you have to do with a physical essence within the repository, you have to explicitly purge the BMO itself. So if I now execute the get content collection again, operation. You'll notice I only have one BMO that is now returned because the other one is not available. But there is another operation that you can actually execute um, to, to uh, still retrieve for you the entire superset of assets that are within your repository. That, op that is actually the content query. So the content query, what it does is it allows a, a, a basically customized solution for querying that is flexible for any vendor to basically expose different ways that a orchestration system can execute a set of queries against a repository. So this case over here, what this content query is going to do is execute uh, everywhere where the status of the asset is online. So if I were to execute this content query, I will get my second BMO, which is online within my repository back. The next thing I can also now do is, how do I return back the one that I have marked as removed? So what I say is, if the status is not online, I want that returned back as part of my content query. So if I scroll down over here, I see now my first um, asset or BMO that is not visible via the get content or the get content collection, but is via the content query. So 
This is a very simplified version of what the content query actually can provide based off the solution that a vendor may want to implement. Uh, we kept it very, very simple, but you can see the flexibility that it can allow uh, for the, the complexity that, that, that can be um, a more complex queries that could be built on this. So now that we have this done, um, what I'm going to go ahead and do is unremove the content for a second. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to now also demonstrate the updating of the, the BMO information, such as the title. So I'm going to unremove my BMO again. And the next thing I'm going to do is the update content properties. So within the update content properties, uh, what I'm going to actually do over here is change the title. So my title was uh, what I showed previously in the get content collection if I go over here. My title is what you see down here, test published asset number one. I'm going to change that to uh, a new title for the content. So if I execute this and I go back and execute the get content collection again, you'll see over here a new title for the content. So I have now updated the metadata within the repository for the asset or BMO. So to let's just, uh, we're almost at the end over here, so let's just go through the final stages of a BMO. So the next operation again that I'm going to now do for a second is remove the content, okay? So after I do the remove content, what I'm actually going to now demonstrate is purge the content. As I said previously, what I could have done is just purge the essence, but that's too simple. So what I now what I have is if I go into my get content collection, again, I'm going to have, uh, well, I, I removed that first uh, essence that was in our uh, first asset that was in there I only have my second asset and but the thing is if I go into my storage location my physical file is still there so when you execute purge content against a repository not only will it actually purge the content it will also purge the essence that or essences that are associated with the uh, the content itself in that case, I did not explicitly have to go and mark and remove each one of the essences that were associated. Just, it's implicit. The fact that you remove an essence and purge the essence, I'm sorry, purge, remove the content and purge the content, it will automatically go ahead and uh, purge all the essences. So if I go into the storage folder over here, my physical essence has now been removed from the storage. So as a recap, we have a, a .NET 4.5 FIM sample repository, which exercised each one of the operations that I demonstrated for everybody today. There are still operations which are within the repository that we did not cover over here, but the basic idea of developing the FIMS uh, reference implementation was to essentially, as I mentioned earlier, to start vendors and other early implementers or um, implementers in general to have a starting point for uh, developing a solution, as well as from a, from a client perspective, they can still use the solution as well to understand what is the behavior within a repository if they were to implement this solution within their, their you know, in-house ecosystems that they, have, they might have. I think that this is the final operations that I wanted to demonstrate. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you.